first reading is from Luke's Gospel. Mary is told she will be the mother of God's Son. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, the town of Gane in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you, you who are highly favored. Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and, you will, and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angels, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered, May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her.
This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is, is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus.
The third, third lesson is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 2. The shepherds hear of the Saviour's birth and go to see him. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on whom earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Thank you. 
to think tonight about why Jesus came. Why did he move into the neighborhood? I think I've turned the mic on. Oh, I haven't. Sorry about that. <laughs> Start again. I always have a few deliberate mistakes. Why did Jesus come? Why did he move into the neighborhood, as one translation puts it? I think if you asked people generally, they might say, well, he came to be a teacher to show us how to live a really good life. Uh, one of the local primary schools, their section on Christianity is headed, Jesus the teacher. And it is almost undeniable that Jesus' teaching has had more impact on the history of the world than any other person who's ever lived. His teaching was extraordinary. And there was something tremendously attractive about his life. It's interesting that when people have a go at Christianity, they attack the church or Paul or Christians, but they hardly ever attack Jesus directly. There's something so good about him that he's almost beyond criticism. But I don't think that Jesus came primarily to be a teacher. One thing is that uh, we don't really need another teacher. We kind of know what we should do, don't we? If you look at all the different religions and philosophies of the world, they kind of say pretty much the same thing. You know, care for the poor, do to others as you want them to do to you, be honest, don't lie, don't steal, be faithful. It's not hard to work out. The problem is not that we don't know it, but that we don't do it. And teaching doesn't change us, it doesn't empower us. Now Jesus did live a, a, a wonderful and attractive life and it's good to try and be like him. People sometimes wear a bracelet with the letters WWJD on it. What would Jesus do? But I have three problems with WWJD. The first is I have no idea. He always does something completely surprising like being born in a stable or talking to the last person you'd expect him to talk to or at the key moment bending down and writing in the dust. So the answer to the question, what would Jesus do, is, I haven't got a clue, mate. Second problem is, what he would do is something amazing, like uh, an incredible piece of insight into what somebody's thinking, or a remarkable story, or a unique miracle, none of which I have the slightest capacity to reproduce. And the third problem I have is that even if I did know what he was going to do, and I could do it, I'd probably mess it up, because I'm a normal, fallible human being, and Jesus was perfect. So Jesus as a great teacher and as, as, or as an example doesn't really empower us, it rather crushes us, it makes us aware of our own inadequacies. It's a bit like when Glenn Hoddle was the England football manager. He would ping a perfect pass from one end of the pitch to the other and then say to his players, just do that. And of course none of them could and it wasn't very encouraging for them. So Jesus, as an example, is too good. He's too perfect. I don't think Jesus came to tell us the answer to the big questions. I think he came to be the answer to those big questions. When the angel came to Joseph, he said, the virgin will give birth and the, they will call the child Emmanuel, God with us. There's an ocean of truth in that one word, Emmanuel, God with us. If you want to know what God is like, don't look up into the sky waiting for a vision. Look at Jesus. Read the Gospels. See what he said. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. That's the beginning of John's Gospel, and that is Jesus, the Word. Well, maybe you say, I'm open to the existence of God. I'm 50-50 on whether he's there or not. But I need somebody to really convince me, to give me a perfect argument, and then I'll believe and of course, people have tried that. Thomas Aquinas, 800 years ago, came up with five proofs for God. They're pretty convincing. But at the end, there's always room for doubt. We can never be sure, can we? Suppose Jesus didn't give us, God didn't give us a perfect argument, but instead he gave us a perfect person. A person against whom there is no argument. You see, if God had given us a perfect argument, then the people who have really clear logical minds would have a great advantage, wouldn't they? And the children or the people with learning difficulties, well, bad luck to them. But a person, anyone can know. And a person, knowing a person, doesn't just involve our mind, it involves our heart, our emotions, everything we are. 
So God came as a perfect person. If you want to know God, then look for Jesus. He's alive, Christians believe, and you can encounter him. And if you want to know where you can encounter him, let me give you a clue. He likes to hang out among his people. But there's something else about the way God came to be with us that is very striking. He wasn't born in a five-star hotel. He was born in a stable. There was no room at the inn. His parents were the poorest of the poor. And very soon he was on the run as a refugee. So right from the beginning, his life was a life of suffering. And that beginning set the pattern for the whole of his life. There he was, helpless, naked, vulnerable, stretched out on bare wood. Does that remind you of anything at the end of his life? Suffering wasn't just an accident. It was a central part of what it means to, for God to be with us. People often say, well, you know, how could a good God allow the suffering that we see in the world today? Surely he would do something. Well, yes, he should do something, but the question is what? What can he do? Suffering is not something that can just be magicked away, is it? Someone who worked in a hospice said that suffering is not a question that needs an answer, is not a problem that needs a solution, it's a mystery that needs a presence. That's what we need, isn't it, when we're struggling and in trouble. We don't need someone to give us a nice, neat explanation of why it happened. We need someone who cares, someone who's with us, someone who understands, who shares in it. And that's what it means for God to be with us. In the novel Life of Pi, the narrator, Pi is a Hindu, and he meets a Christian called Father Martin who tells him the Christian story. And Pi says, I couldn't imagine Lord Krishna consenting to be stripped naked, humiliated, mocked, dragged through the streets, and to top it off, crucified at the hands of mere humans. Even resurrected, the son must have had the taste of death forever in his mouth. The Trinity must be tainted by it. There must be a stench at the right hand of God the Father. The horror must be real. Why would God wish that upon himself? Love was Father Martin's answer. Love. God with us. God coming into our suffering and using it for our benefit to save the world. That's the Christian story. And there's no other story like that. Some people see suffering as a wrecking ball that demolishes Christianity, but I don't think that's what it is. I think it's the foundation stone on which the whole of Christianity is built. At the end of his life, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, show us the way. And Jesus didn't say what every other great religious teacher and guru has said through the ages, this is the way. Instead he said, I am the way. Come to me. I'm the answer. I haven't come to show you the answers. I've come to be the answer. You've got to come through him. The answer is not a path, it's a person. Failed in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Seek, Jesus said, and you will find. Don't you want to know him?
fourth reading is taken from Matthew 2. Wise men come and worship the newborn king. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too can come and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over a place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him there. They opened their treasures for him and presented gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country via a different route.
So thank you again so much for coming. I'm sorry you weren't able to sing. And uh, please leave carefully without chatting to other people. Sorry about that. Uh, there are quite a few Gospels and other booklets. If you want to, they're all free, so do pick one up at the back. And um, do come again at Christmas. You'll see the services there. The only change to that is there won't be an 8 a.m. communion on Christmas Day. But the other services are all as planned, at least as things stand at the moment. So I'm going to say a final prayer. And may you have a very joyful and blessed Christmas in spite of all the struggles that we're enduring. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you did not stand far off from your world, but you came into it as one of us, that you came to be with us, to bring the peace that the world cannot give. And we pray that even in these times of uncertainty, we might know that peace the peace that passes all understanding. And so may the peace of God guard your hearts and minds and may you know his blessing this Christmas, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you and all you love this Christmas and forevermore. Amen.